You guys make Randy feel welcome tonight. Hey, Randy, do you want to use this mic or do you want to put the headset deal on or you just use this one? Okay. Um, you guys know this, but it also always bears repeating. Uh, I am not the senior pastor of the Father's house. How many people say hallelujah? I'm senior. Yeah, he, he's senior. He's my senior. He's my elder. But no, uh, what we do here at the Father's house is this novel concept that we found in the New Testament called plurality of elders, and it's where uh, multiple elders govern the church together. Uh, I always have to restate this because sometimes it's like a calf at a new gate. People are like, what are you talking about? But Randy is not greater than me, and I'm not greater than Randy. We actually do this together. Do you believe it? It's the truth. It's absolutely the truth. Now, we have different gifts. We have different abilities. We have different graces. He's got a lot more wisdom than me. But what we do is when we come together, it's a beautiful thing. And there will also be a third elder to round this out. So, you know, when you have one person doing virtually everything, they might be the best at the thing they do, but what else are you missing? I just said something. They might be awesome at what they do. They might be the best pastor ever known, but what about a prophet? I mean, and then you might have this crazy prophet, but, but what about the evangelist, right? So we need, we need more than one guy trying to do everything. Hallelujah, I'm not supposed to do everything. Amen. <laughs> That's an old wineskin that is failing. But here's the deal. Randy is uh, one of the elders here along with myself at the Father's house, and the Lord brought these people here. Is that fair? That's fair. The Lord just supernaturally brought these guys here, and I actually never met them until we did the public launch here last July. Wasn't that the first time you guys came was to our initial meeting? Man, we, had, we would have never met you guys if we'd have stayed in my living room all that time. So praise God that we came out of the closet here and... So, hallelujah. But Randy has a word tonight to share, and I'm excited to hear it. So you guys may welcome Randy Hornbeck. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> oh, thank you, my dear. Can you open it for me? Oh, thanks. Well, Chris asked me during lunch, it's been a few months ago, We were talking, and we were talking about the topic of authority. And he said, looked at me and said, I don't know anybody better than you to speak about authority. And then in the prayer meeting uh, before um, the service, uh, he referenced that. He, he, he told everybody that was in there. He said, um, you know, Randy's got background in law enforcement. He's going to be speaking on authority tonight. And so, uh, this, that's true. I have uh, 20 years uh, as a law enforcement officer back in Indiana. I'm uh, currently the security manager for a large evangelical disaster relief organization. Um, in between that, I spent uh, four years working uh, for the State Department doing personal uh, protection security, which uh, included... Uh, working with uh, explosive detection dogs. So that, that's my pedigree. But what Chris doesn't know, and let me just say that last night I woke up, I woke up at 1.15 this morning, and I was awake until 4. I had great peace about what I was going to share. But then, after Kim got up and we had breakfast and I had a couple cups of coffee, my mind was beginning to cloud over. And I begin to I begin to uh, sense something that I don't ever sense. Uh, at first, I thought it was the caffeine and lack of sleep, but I started to feel like I was having an anxiety attack. I don't have anxiety attacks, and so I knew where this was coming from. And so I told Kim, I said, I, I, I you know, she could tell I was like, you know, something was going on. So I got my got my clothes on and I went to the trail, which is right down our house, and I went into the woods. And I began to seek God. I, I mean, I was crying out to God. I was, I began to, to quote, it is written, I've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. 
I am a king and I'm a priest because of the blood that was shed for me. I'm not an orphan. I'm a son. I began to quote to the enemy. And as I paced back and forth and back and forth and I began to speak to the enemy and the peace of God began to settle in on my heart and that anxiety began to lift, I heard a whisper. There was a whisper in my ear and it said, you're not worthy to speak on authority. I said, you're right. Jesus said, agree quickly with your adversaries. I'm going to agree with him tonight, and I'm going to tell you what he was referring to. July 14th, which is today, 1971, I received my discharge from the Army. I left uh, Baltimore, Maryland with two pieces of paper, a small bag with a little bit of clothes. In one hand was a one-way ticket on a Greyhound bus to Anderson, Indiana. In the other hand was my military discharge from the Army. And it said in letters about this high, undesirable. I had spent 89 days AWOL from the 82nd Airborne, and I had just spent six weeks in a minimum security lockup in Baltimore in a military base. On the way home in the bus, I really didn't care. I had done this to myself. I had actually, I was not raised in the church. I had actually no Christian background, no Christian influence in my life. Uh, I was doing a lot of drugs, um, and I didn't care. But within a couple of months, I began to realize the depression began to set in and I began to become really despondent. By the middle of October, uh, myself and a friend, we'd gone to sell a little bit of pot to another guy and he had been a heroin addict. And he said, um, when I asked if he wanted to buy anything, he said, no, man, I've been praising Jesus. And I was like, what? Anyway, he witnessed to us that day, and I had a dramatic conversion that night and gave my life to the Lord Jesus. And I was delivered that night from a lot of demonic influence in my life, from the life that I'd been living. So I am not worthy to speak on authority but he that lives inside me is greater than he that whispered in my ear. And he's worthy to speak on authority. Amen? So Chris, a few days ago, texted me and asked me for a title. And I knew that I was, I was seeking the Lord about authority, but I, I'd actually been seeking the Lord about doing something else. I just thought, well, I don't want to just speak on authority because that was the topic of discussion. But uh, anyway, I just felt like the Lord was saying, pursue this. So I, I, I said, let me think about the title. And the next day I sent back and I just said, let's call this walking in and under authority. So first of all, I want to talk about walking under authority. I have had some experience now, 30, almost 35 years of law enforcement and security. So I've been in a position of authority and I've related to people that are walking uh, under authority, that are um, reacting to authority. Here's a, here's a statement that I found on the Kansas City um, International House of Prayer website. It's interesting. Authority is a central issue in all life. We honor it out of respect for God, his authority, and his purposes. We seek to be free from all forms of dishonoring authority because of our love and reverence for our Father. Therefore, in every sphere of life, we want to know what authority we possess, who is over us and who is under us. Submission to authority is a spiritual issue. Dishonoring authority is one of Satan's primary principles of operation. Samuel 15.23 says, Rebellion 
is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. While I was AWOL from the Army, I went on May 1st of 1971 uh, to an anti-war demonstration in Washington, D.C. And um, this at the time, and I think it's still on record, as having been the largest uh, anti-war demonstration. There were close to half a million uh, people there. While I was there, I met up with the, one of the guys I was going to meet with, and he had just come from a meeting with a guy named Jerry Rubin. I don't know, those of you that are old enough uh, might remember that name, but he was an extreme radical. Later that evening, we were in an apartment, uh, the contacts with the people uh, that, that I had and the, and the people I was with. And I, at that point in my life, I was, I was very rebellious, obviously, or I would not have gone AWOL from the Army. But I also was just simply wanting to follow Timothy Leary's uh, philosophy of uh, tune in, turn on, and drop out. Basically, just be a hippie and just, you know, just get high and, and be a hippie. But at that at that demonstration at that apartment that day, I was now in a, in a room, or actually in a large apartment with these radicals. And they were starting to talk about how to make bombs. Even in my unregenerate state of mind, that really shook me to the core. And the next day, a friend and I got out of there, got out of town and hitchhiked back here to North Carolina. But I experienced a, a spirit of anarchy that was just raging mad. And I, I honestly believe when I came to the Lord that there was a spirit of rebellion that, or possibly even a spirit of anarchy that, that was removed from my life. So, authority, anarchy, anarchy submission, rebellion, they're all related. And I want to talk about four areas or four spheres of delegated authority um, where these, these entities meet, okay? Um, there are four spheres of delegated authority. So working on the premise that God is, God has to be the author of all legitimate authority in the earth. And he delegates Authority is delegated. One of the spheres is family. In Ephesians uh, 5 and 6, Paul is talking to the family, and he talks about, this is where the famous scripture is, wives submit to your husbands. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, don't make your children angry. So this is one sphere where we see authority being expressed. And one, our first experiences as children with authority and the opportunity to learn what authority is. I want to take a second here and I want to divert a little bit and talk about fathers. Because of the issue in America with a lack of fathers. There are a lot of AWOL fathers there are a lot of fathers that are not walking um, and, and fulfilling their call as a biblical, godly father. Uh, this is an issue that's really dear to our hearts. Uh, one of our grandsons is without a father. So this is a priority um, of prayer for us that we pray about the fact that there's not a father in his life. And it's a concern uh, that if you read, especially in the black community, I shouldn't say especially, it's everywhere, but in the black community, they talk about it. They're the ones talking about it. The Caucasian community, the white community, Hispanic community, I don't hear them talking about it like our black uh, African-American brothers. But I want to read something uh, from Chris Johnson's book. Uh, it's called The Fullness of Ministry where he talks about fathers. And the reason I wanna, I wanna talk about the fathers for a minute is that so many people uh, have been affected in a negative way by their fathers uh, and it affects their attitude toward authority. Many times you'll find out that people that cannot accept authority or rebel against authority 
it's directly related to the fact that they had a bad uh, father image. So in, in his book, um, The Fullness of Ministry, Chris says it was the fathers, our, God, our heavenly father, original intention that earthly fathers be an exact and precise representation, expression, and manifestation of him and his heart to their children. The fall of man has prevented that from being so. One might say to whatever degree one's earthly father failed to be that expression, manifestation, and representation of the father himself, to that degree there are wounds that will need to be healed by the heavenly father. The father himself must reparent us all. There are many different kinds of earthly fathers, and the impact they have had on sons relate to father varies greatly. So then he lists a few. The first one is AWOL fathers. They're absentee. They're not there. They're just simply not there. Number two is deceased fathers. At any childhood age, uh, the child will, will experience abandonment. Unaffectionate, non-demonstrative fathers, disconnected. Many World War II fathers came through the Depression, World War II, the Korean War, uh, were unaffectionate. To them, they, it was uh, not a, a, a part of their manhood to be able to express, express affection. Emotionally detached fathers, they're unknown, undisclosed. Then they ha you have uninvolved fathers. They didn't care or they didn't even want to know you. Emotionally abusive fathers, they were unsafe. They assaulted and insulted your dignity. Physically abusive fathers, they were enraged and violent, completely unpredictable, which instilled fear. Sexually abusive fathers, they betrayed trust, destroyed innocence, raped the soul and assaulted dignity. Overly religious fathers, they were law-bound, performance-based, demanding harsh, rigid, strict. Passive fathers, the milk toast, pushover wimps. You don't see too many of them around here. Uh, dictator fathers, authoritarian, iron-fisted, absolute power. They wanted to crush the rebellion. It's never enough fathers, impossible to please. Relatively good fathers. Relatively good examples. They tried hard. They did their best, but they were still flawed mirrors of the father. Then you had, have really good fathers. Spiritual men, safe, trustworthy, compassionate, understanding, tender-hearted, but still flawed. It only takes a casual perusal of that list to immediately identify some of the hurts, wounds, traumas, disappointments, misperceptions and hindrances that accompany the list. There are messages that were sent to the children about themselves and about God through the fractured mirrors of our fathers. We tend to project onto the father himself those characteristics we saw in our fathers. Call it projection theology if you like, but it is very real. Chris just finished uh, the third part of a series where he so eloquently uh, laid out to us the Heavenly Father and gave us a vision and a view of what the Heavenly Father is like. Number two, the marketplace or the play, your place of employment. That's a place where we meet authority. Colossians 3, 22 through 25. This is from the message. Servants do what you're told to by your earthly masters and don't just do the minimum that will get by. Do your best. Work from the heart for your real master, for God, confident you'll, that you'll get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're, that you're serving is Christ. The soul and servant who does shoddy work will be held responsible. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. We serve Jesus as we serve them. 
whether or not they are saved, we obey God first. When accepting a job, we accept God's authority through those leaders. Before I got into law enforcement, Kim and I got married in Minnesota and moved back to Indiana in April of 1978. And I took a job as a printer. I'd been printing, uh, working uh, offset printing presses for the church up in Minnesota. And um, so I took a job in printing. I was the first employee outside the family. It was a husband, a wife, and a son. And I worked there for a year. I'll tell you what, every day I had to bear my cross. The, the, the man, the husband, the boss, he was uh, a dictator. Uh, he was a man of... Um, great explosive anger. Uh, he would yell and, and demean his son at work. He would yell and demean his wife at work. He would try to and want to do that to me as well, uh, but he would always catch himself. And I would come home night after night after night and say, Kim, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. But you know what? That year I was there. I stuck it out till I got another job. I so wanted to leave, but at that point in my life as a believer, I, I believed enough in the idea of submission to authority that I couldn't just leave. And I felt like God had given me this job. I mean, I really went into that job knowing that this had been a provision from God for me. So, you know, I hear people talk about their jobs and how they hate their jobs, and, and I'm not perfect in that area. There are times when I complain about my job. Not so much here, but uh, a few years ago. But um, it's another opportunity where we can submit to authority. Now, having come from my uh, anarchist, rebellious background, it's not difficult for me to submit to authority. I'm telling you, I know what it's like to be a rebel. And I know some of you in here were rebels, and you know what I'm talking about. So... Sphere number three is the civil government. And I've worked in the civil government now, uh, well, I don't now, but for 20 years. Um, 1 Peter 2.13 says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. That's a hard statement right there. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment upon themselves. I, I'm fully aware that there are bad people in some civil jobs. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen in the news about bad law enforcement officers, but I still, I will maintain to my death that 99% plus of the law enforcement officers in this country are very, very good officers. Um, it's interesting to me when you, when, you, when you read both of those passages, Peter wrote one, Paul wrote the other. This was, both of these were written during a time when Nero was the emperor of Rome. Now think about that. I don't know if you know who that guy was, but he was He was crazy. He was demonic. He, he took, he was the, uh, he persecuted Christians to their death. He took Christians and put them on a pole and lit them for torches at night to light the city of Rome. And Peter is saying, submit for the Lord's sake to every human authority. Paul is saying, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. There's some, something of intrinsic value in the position of authority. And here's what I think it is. Genesis chapter 1. God said to Adam and Eve that they were to take dominion over the earth. They were to rule the earth. But there was this great insurrection 
Lucifer took several of his, a third of the angels and rebelled against God and left, were kicked out or thrown out or expelled from the presence of God. And then they came sneaking around in the garden and, and seduced Eve and Adam. And they basically gave up the dominion in the garden to Satan. And so, I don't know if you remember in Luke 4, when Jesus was in the desert and he was fasting and Satan came to him with these temptations. And, and Satan actually said to Jesus, all authority is mine, I'm going to give it to you. He really wasn't lying. He's a liar and a deceiver from the, from the beginning. But Adam and Eve had given all of that authority over the enemy, over to the enemy. So he had that authority. It was illegitimate authority, but he had the authority. So then Jesus comes along. Praise the Lord. So Jesus comes along and lives a holy life. He is manifesting God in the flesh. He said, when you see me, you've seen the Father. He lives above sin, even though he's a man. But he's fully alive with the, the presence and spirit of God inside him. So he takes back that authority. Not only by the fact that he resisted sin, he, was, he never ever gave in to the enemy's temptations, but he gave his life on the cross and the blood was spilled that we not only could have eternity in heaven, but that that authority would be taken back and given to the church. So through the, the life, the death, the resurrection, the enthrone, or the uh, uh, resurrection enthronement, Jesus pouring out his spirit to us on the day of Pentecost, he has taken back all of that authority. Satan no longer has any authority. Whatever authority he manifests is illegitimate because Jesus has taken it back through the cross, through his resurrection. So that is why I believe the positions of authority where God has delegated because of the insurrection, the rebellion, it's so important to Paul and Peter. They see how important it is that the act of submission be, I mean, we need to live lives of submission. And again, no, not, not if it's bad authority. I mean, that's kind of, it's a given. Uh, Peter and John, when they were you know, approached and, and told by the Sanhedrin that they couldn't preach, Peter's like, yeah, right. You know, you're going to tell me I'm not going to say, you know, speak the words of, of truth, that I'm not going to be, be able to preach what I've seen and what I've been taught. Of course, if there's a, ba a bad person in a position, we, we don't submit to them. But there's, an intri there's intrinsic value in the positions of authority that have been delegated from God to bring submission into our lives. It's an opportunity for us, especially as believers, to live a crucified life to live a laid down life, to live a sacrificial life by submitting. Um, every day, if, you, if you're paying attention, you will see opportunities. You'll see positions of authority where you're given an opportunity to submit, not just in your relationship with husband and wife. And let me just say that, that thing about wives submitting to the husbands, I've never said to my wife, Scripture says you should submit to me. I mean, I probably joked about it, and we, she knew it was in jest. But in a serious manner, I have never, ever said you should submit to me. And if any of you have ever told your wives you need to submit to me, you just blew it. Because you, real, you just expose yourself as not really getting it at all. Because you're supposed to love her as Christ loved the church. If you're going to demand that, you just lost your authority. You just abdicated it by making that statement. Okay? So, I mean, this is not... <laughs> Thanks, Pat. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, just, it's not blind. There's a purpose in submission. 
Um, there's a purpose in submission. Sphere number four, the church. And I'm not going to say much at all about this because I am confident that Chris Johnson, if not next week in our ongoing relationship with Chris, he's going to speak to uh, the church and the leadership issue. But Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. Amen, Chris? Walking under authority builds character. Walking in authority is related to character. So walking in authority. Matthew 16, 24, and 25 Walking in authority starts at the cross. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Any authority that you have as a believer starts right there at the cross. Let me just share First of all, the diff- do you know the difference between authority and power? Authority is the right to rule. Power is the ability to rule. In the charismatic community, Pentecostal community, we talk a lot about power, but we don't really talk as much about authority. But authority really actually has more of a position to subvert the enemy than many, many times than power because um, the enemy has a degree of illegitimate power, but if you're walking in authority, he can't assert that power over you. So true authority, true godly, God-given authority trumps any power he might be able to manifest any time. True godly authority trumps power, simply said. There are four, let me give you four qualifications for exercising Christ's authority. Um, Ephesians 1, 18 through 23. Number one is belief. You've got to believe that you've got authority. Ephesians 1, 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all authority, all, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything everywhere. And on down into Ephesians 2 verse 6 says, And God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ. Thus, there is the source of power, excuse me, authority that you can walk in, that you can access as a believer. But you've got to believe it. One of the things I did in law enforcement, um, I did several things in the course of my career, but one of the things uh, was one of the uh, job capacities I functioned in was to train new officers. I was a field training officer. So uh, a police officer, I I served in Indiana. So a police officer in Indiana goes to the academy for 16 weeks. They learn everything, criminal law, traffic law. They learn everything they need to learn. They go through all kinds of scenarios. Uh, They qualify with their handgun. They come back. Then they go through the field training program, which is 12 weeks. They ride with a police officer, um, usually a sergeant or lieutenant. Uh, I did it both as a sergeant and then later as a lieutenant. And you have a curriculum you go over with them. They um, have to go so many weeks riding before they can drive. They have to go so many weeks driving before they can. uh, It's it's a graduated step of 
of being authorized to be a police officer. Now they got sworn in and they've gotten their badge, but now they're going through the training. So they've, they've got the authority. A police officer has authority through the state legislature, okay? Police officers have jurisdictions where they work, whether it's a city, county, state, or you've got federal officers. But police officers, I've watched this over and over again, they have no more authority after they get sworn in and get that badge than they do after all that training's over with. Same authority. They're now ready to go to work on their own for the agency they're working for, but the, the, the authority, the positional legal authority that they have is exactly the same. So then they get out on their own. You might roll up on a crash together and one of the rookie cops come up. They're always timid. I was timid. First day on, by myself, I remember the sheriff saying, you sounded uh, pretty reserved out there. Well, the first day I worked, I, I covered seven traffic accidents. And I'm like, yeah. And so, but I've seen it over and over and over and over again. And it's kind of the same concept with a believer. The authority we have, because we're seated with Christ and Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, is a positional legal thing. It's done. It's a, it's a done deal. A brand new believer that's born again, that has believed upon the Lord Jesus because the blood was shed for him, has the same authority that I do 48 years into this thing. But the, just like the police officer, it's a, it's a matter of them exercising their authority. And then you'll see them suddenly. I remember when I uh, be, suddenly felt confident Unfortunately, it was right after a uh, vehicle crash where two, two young ladies were killed. But you see it in police officers. You could watch a, a rookie cop come out and direct traffic or try to, and he's like not sure what he's supposed to do or not sure that he even has the authority to stop a vehicle. And then like, I'm like, get out of the way, stop. You know, and the car will screech to a halt. I didn't have the power to stop that vehicle, but I had the authority. And I knew I had the authority. Do you hear that? I knew I had the authority to stop it. And the cars, all I never once got hit. I'm in full uniform. Stop. You know, there's a position of authority out on Elkin Highway. And I, and I uh, encounter this guy every day. I work out. Uh, North Wilkesboro, Elkin Highway, and they've got this construction going on. And uh, I have to run out to one of our buildings, a couple of our buildings out there. They're widening the road. It's been going on for at least two years now. I saw one of the foremen just the other day, and, and he had told us early on it was going to go through the end of 2020. And uh, he said, yeah, it's going to go through the end of 2020. But I drive out, I go <clears throat> out Elkin Highway, and they're doing this construction, and there's a signman. He's got an orange vest on. He's got a steel pole. One side of the sign says yield, one says stop. And it amazes me that I have no clue who this guy is. I don't know what his personal life is like, but when he's got that orange vest on and he's got that pole and that sign, all he has to do is to the flip of a wrist, cars begin to stop. What, what authority does he have? Department of Transportation? transportation for the state of North Carolina. If somebody decides to run through that stop sign, all he has to do is tell his boss, we'll call the highway patrol. He's got the whole state of North Carolina behind him. If he takes that vest off and puts that sign down, he has absolutely no authority at all. It's the principle of authority. He can't physically stop those cars. I have yet, and I've and I'm not, I know that I've gone through there at least a hundred times in two years, and almost probably 99, I get stopped. But when I'm submitting to that authority, I, I, of course, as I was studying this, I've been thinking more about it. When that sign turned, and I'm always in a hurry. I'm always on, on a time, you know, I'm on a, I, I've got to be there. And I'm like, when that sign turns and I stop, it gives me an opportunity, opportunity to walk in the spirit, or in this case, sit in the spirit, because I'm sitting in the driver's seat. But it gives me an opportunity 
to let Christ live through me. I mean, I, you know if you're in a hurry, you know what tends to come out. But yeah, he flips that sign, and it's amazing to me. That's, a, that's just a typical example of authority. And, and he uses it, but he uses it correctly according to the state requirement. So, belief. You've got to believe that you have authority. Jesus, you might as a believer not be confident enough because you've not encountered uh, enough of spiritual activity to where you've actually had to use it. And you may be considered a rookie, but Jesus is a seasoned veteran. And you're in him and he's in you. Got that? He's a seasoned veteran and he's in you. And you've got that authority. And he's got that authority if you believe it. So you've got to believe it. Number two, humility. I would define humility. It's not a milquetoast, passive, you know, thing. Humility is confidence which is properly placed. Simple as that. My humility is that I know I can't do this, I know I can't do that, but I know the one who lives inside me can do it. That's humility. You know, it's not, you know, being meek and mild. That's a whole different thing. Uh, But humility is confidence which is properly placed. So to be able to walk in authority, you've got to be humble. Both James and Peter said this, that God will resist the proud but give grace to the humble. I've seen, and I did it, in my early days uh, in the charismatic movement, we got into some crazy uh, exorcism type stuff, and we were doing some crazy stuff, but we were, we were uh, going beyond, uh, as Paul would, would call it, his sphere of authority, we were going beyond our sphere of authority. Um, and so, and it was all motivated by pride. All of it was motivated by pride. We'd come into this, uh, this understanding that demons would be subject to us, and we were going after them. We were kind of like, we considered ourselves uh, spiritual freedom fighters, you know. We were, whether you wanted to get rid of that demon or not, we were going to cast it out of you, you know. And we, for several months, about six months, we got into some stuff. I mean, seriously, that was before I was in law enforcement, uh, it's a wonder we weren't arrested for criminal confinement. I mean, we wrestled with people trying to cast things, these things out of them. And they none of them. I mean, I, I think that we tag teamed, you know. It was with like six of us on one of them. And so, But anyway, don't do that. That is not proper godly authority. That is being motivated by pride. And honestly... Uh, I tend to, I, I find myself steering away from the terminology of spiritual warfare because that terminology kind of has been hijacked by some circles. Uh, and, and they're, you know, maybe operating out of pride and not humility. So, but, but spiritual warfare is, is absolutely the real deal. But um, you've got to be humble if you're going to walk in the authority that Christ has given you. Um, So, number three is boldness. Three times before Joshua entered the promised land, God told him, four times, God told him, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. So, boldness. Um, There have been times in my life, not a lot because I don't go after it, uh, my philosophy on exercising spiritual authority over any demonic powers or presences is that I'm going after the purpose of God in my life. I'm not going after and looking for a demon anymore behind every bush. As I pursue God and as I seek God and as I worship him and as I, with all my heart and with uh, confidence which is properly placed, uh, desire to, to, to please him. And if, if, if I'm approached by one or one pops out or somebody, you know, requests some help with one, we'll go after it. 
There was a case years ago back in Indiana, and we were worshiping in, on Sunday morning. And suddenly, I mean, we're 30 minutes into worship, suddenly uh, this young teenager just fell over in the aisle. And I could tell his mom was, I mean, they were visitors. So worship continued on, and as I moved over to see what was going on, I, and I said to her, I said, is this, is this normal? She says, no. She had no idea what was going on. And I looked at him, and his eyes were rolled back in his head, and he was just going, he was grunt, gr- uh, grunting. I was like, I know the authority I've got, and I didn't want to disrupt anybody, and I, didn't, I know I don't have to yell because of the authority is authority. It's positional. So I got down on my knees. I laid down next to the guy, and I whispered to him in his ear. I said, loose him in Jesus' name. And he went, his eyes went boom. And he, and he was embarrassed then because he, noted, he saw he was on the floor, and he sat up. He said, what happened? I said, it's okay. It's okay. Somebody had already called an ambulance, and they got there, and they checked him over. He signed a waiver. Boom. So I wasn't looking for that. There was another instance when uh, in law enforcement, we were in the office and we were told that the city police department was bringing a guy in and that he was fighting. Uh, he was a very, very strong combatant. So three or four of us came over from the offices to help out in the booking area. And uh, this guy was so little. He wasn't, it was my height, but about a third my weight. And, but it took six officers to carry this guy in. And we were like, okay, this guy's on some kind of drug. So they carried him from the booking area back. They popped open the door to the cell. It was called the pink room at the time. It was uh, a passive pink color. The theory was that if you put somebody in there that had bad behavior, it would subdue them. Uh, had no effect on this guy. They, we pushed him into the cell, slammed the door, and a, and he started banging his head against the window. He started banging his head against the wall. All of a sudden, he went, his feet came up, and he slammed down on the, on the floor, on the concrete, and he began to roll fast. It was like a log rolling across the floor. Hit the wall, came back, hit the wall, hit the wall. Two of the guys that were there were believers. Tim looked at me, and he went, demons, demonic. I went, yeah. So we started praying. He stopped. He just stopped right in the middle of the room. And all these officers are like, holy, what's going on? And he, all of a sudden, we looked, and he was asleep, and we left. And one of the officers looked at me and said, uh, do you really believe what just happened? I said, what do you say? I mean, you just saw what happened. So... What was it? Was it spiritual or not? I mean, we perceived it to be, and we prayed and took authority over it, and that activity stopped because we believed that we had the authority, and uh, we weren't going to allow that to continue and risk him harming himself. So, number four is dependence. The authority I'm talking about is not an independent authority. Jesus said, I only do the things which I see the Father doing. You can't just on your own go downtown looking to stir up demonic activity. Well, you can. Uh, you're going you're gonna to get yourself in a bind. But it's dependent authority. We're dependent upon the will of the Father. And again, if you are seeking God and his kingdom and all these things are being added, and you have to take authority over something, you've got the authority to do it. Just be bold, believe it, do it in humility, and uh, depend upon God, and you have the authority to do it. Colossians 2, 13 and 15. When you were dead in your sins and in, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. That's what I was talking about earlier. Jesus 
Yes, he died that we might be saved and live in eternity with him. But he took back the authority that the enemy had illegally from Adam and Eve. He took that back, and he's given it back to the church. Just, um, just a little example, a story, something that happened um, to me, to us, concerning disarming the powers. Um, it's patrolling up on the northern part of the county, and I start seeing at this house where I drive by every day, a big four by eight sign and it's hand painted help exclamation point. I was like, Whoa, what is that? So <clears> that was literally the uh, county line and then the city. It was just in the county. So I turned around, I went to the city police department and I said, Hey, what, what's up with the sign out there? Do you know what, who lives there? I had never dealt with anybody at that house. The grass was overgrown. The house sat back off of the road. It was a state highway. Um, and, one of the, and the officer said, oh, that's, yeah, that's Mrs. Smith. You've never heard of her? I said, no, I've never heard of her. He said, well, she's full-blown mentally ill. She just got out of Logansport. Logansport is a uh, hospital for the criminally insane in, in Indiana. And she had just gotten out. She had actually shot a police officer and gone to been sentenced by the uh, Department of Correction to do some time in that hospital, the mental hospital, and she was out now. And so they knew about her uh, because she had been in the area for a long time. So, okay, wow. Um, the next day I drove by, there was another sign out. It might have been a couple of days later, another sign out. The one said help. The other one said, they've taken my medication. <clears throat> so, okay, I'm, you know, just watching it, just watching it, just watching it. Within a day or two more, get a call to the house. The husband is very concerned for this lady and said she's gotten off her medication, she's very paranoid, and that she has a bunch of knives that she's put in a, in her uh, under her bed, under her pillow. So we go, the sergeant and I, and uh, I was a patrolman at the time, and we talk to the husband, we do a report, we take the knives, we take her, to the local hospital, we do an involuntary commitment. Uh, she got committed to the hospital. She was there about three days. They put her on her medication. She got out. She stopped taking her medication again. So <clears throat> it was on a Saturday morning. I remember this. I seldom worked day shift in those days. On a Saturday morning, get a call. They call me on the radio. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning. Go to Alexandria Police Department. That's the police department I'd gone to to ask about her. Well, the husband was there, and he was telling me that she had gotten off her medication again. She had a, a five-gallon can of gas that she, was, she had a gun. She was threatening to kill anybody that came in the house. She was going to kill herself or anybody that came in the house. She was going to burn the house down. She, she was done. So I call, uh, this is before cell phones, used their hardline phone, called it in. They sent my backup. It, it, it happened to be the same sergeant that was with me days before that went into this house. And so we get there. I got there first quite a bit long, uh, several minutes ahead of the sergeant. And I see with my peripheral, first of all, I'd made a round around the house. I could hear her incoherently saying things really loud. And I isolated the room she was in. I, I was down below that window, and I could tell she was right in there. And I looked, and I could see the sewer line coming up, and I'm, I'm like, this is the bathroom. She's in the bathroom. Then I start thinking about her history. She's killed a police officer. She's mentally ill. She's off her medication. She had all these knives. She's paranoid. I don't have my vest on. I left it at home. I don't have life. We've, I had uh, county life insurance, but we had been talking about me getting more insurance. Hadn't done that yet. And I felt the fear starting to grip me. I mean, this is a legitimately serious situation where she is very capable of shooting me and the sergeant. Anyway, with my peripheral vision, I see the neighbor coming over, and he says, come here, come here, come here. Went over. He said, hey, don't worry. I filed the firing pin down off that gun. And I'm like, okay. Uh, so this is an analogy I'm going to use to, to prove a point. 
So if you're listening to this and you're a police officer or military person, don't get caught up by the tactics that I'm about to tell you because the tactics were wrong. But what happened was the sergeant gets there, the neighbor tells him the same thing. The sergeant rushes up to the sliding glass door, was able to jimmy it open. We, he went charging in and I'm like, I'm not letting him, letting him go in by himself. So I go in behind him. She's still yelling. We follow the voice. He goes to the door. He kicks the door. He kicks the door. The door flies open. There she was with the gun against the wall. She had it to her temple, and she yelled, no, click, no, click, and we were able to grab her, take the gun away. It was loaded, but the firing pin had been filed off. So the tactics were, were wrong. We should have done things differently. The sergeant decided to fully depend and trust on the word of the neighbor that that truly was the gun he worked with and he test fired. But for the purpose of this example, if you're walking in your authority, in your jurisdiction, in your sphere of authority, the enemy doesn't have any power over you. He's been disarmed. Some might say, some might say, you didn't have the authority to go in the house. You didn't have a warrant. We didn't need a warrant. As a matter of fact, our authority to go in that house circumvented our county authority because there, was, there is um, case law based on situations very similar to that ruled upon by the U.S. Supreme Court. So our authority was national. It was from the U.S. Supreme Court. We had the authority to go in there. If you have the authority to be in a certain situation, the enemy will not have any power over you. And I believe that with everything within me. So you, if he's been disarmed, why is there so much demonic activity in the world? <clears throat> well... He's a liar, a deceiver, the only authority. He has no authority. Jesus has all the authority. The only power that he has is what he might lie to us, lie to people in the world. The open doors that people are living in sin, they're inviting him in, taking control of their lives. Uh, believers that don't believe they have authority, they, uh, the word says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They don't have the knowledge that they have authority over demonic powers. And so that's his only power. That's his only power. Now, I'm, uh, there's an example, um, kind of an, uh, it's a um, World War II story. September 2nd, 1945, uh, General Douglas MacArthur was on the USS Missouri. And he was with a Japanese general and they signed the, the Japanese surrender agreement. September 2nd, 1945, the war with Japan ended. It was officially over. But on the, uh, there's an island in the Philippines where there was a small group of Japanese soldiers that refused to believe that the war was over. I verified this. I remember this story from a long time ago, so I looked it up. There was a handful of them, and they were committing guerrilla warfare throughout that, that island in the name of Japan because they refused to believe the war was over. One of those guys didn't even give up for 29 years. 1974, I think it was. They brought in a Japanese major that was able to, to communicate with him and got him to turn himself in. He still had a dress uniform after all those years on the run. That's, the war was over. The war is over for Satan and his minions. But they're running around with illegitimate power, not believing, trying to deceive, trying to cause us to believe their lies. Colossians 2, 13, 15 says they're disarmed. Their powers and authorities are disarmed. He, Jesus, made a public spectacle spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. 
I can just imagine when Jesus died and resurrected, all the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places gasping and crying and freaking out because we're exposed, we're done. But yet, they're not willing to submit to the fact that the war is over. But they have no authority over you. They have no authority over me. Amen? James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. My experience... Um, I didn't get many teach. I didn't get any teachings on this. this was all from experience um, back in the early seventies. Um, but my experience is just a couple of practical um, suggestions. Um, resisting the devil, he will flee because that because it because it's written. But he may not flee right away. He may be testing to see how much he can get away with with you. How much resistance are you going to give? A lot of Christians, in the name of the sovereignty of God, or because they're ignorant and they don't know they have authority, or they don't believe they have authority, say, oh, well, you know, I'm going through the storm. We do go through things that God allows to build our character. But there are things that Christians are going through that are illegitimate circumstances they could take authority over that is actually uh, demonic. So another thing I've learned is that uh, Satan, his minions, are not omnipresent. They're certainly not omnipotent, but they're not omnipresent. In other words, they are not everywhere all the time like God is, which means... They can't read your minds. So when you're going to resist the enemy, don't just think it. You've got to speak it. Like Jesus said, it is written. And I've experienced that when I I would be oppressed by something. And I used to just think, you know, think scriptures. But I learned that if I speak it and I'm speaking the truth, he's he's, he's going to flee. Okay? 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Looking for someone to devour. He's he's defeated. He just has not agreed to it yet. I've heard some people say he doesn't know it yet. Other people say he knows it, but he's just given up his last fight. So, Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 10 about his sphere of authority. Law enforcement officers have jurisdictions. I couldn't go outside of my county to do certain things. I want to encourage you to seek God for your sphere of authority. What is your sphere of authority? Don't just take this information and go try to lay hands and cast a demon out of somebody. You'll probably get yourself in trouble. Ask the Lord What is your jurisdiction? What is your sphere of authority? He'll show you. Um, But again, our purpose here is to worship God. Our purpose is to to live our lives every day uh, seeking him and seeking his will. And if we get oppressed by the enemy, we have authority over him. We will take authority over him. If you get oppressed and you can't, and you can't, uh, resist it on your own or get rid of it on your own, call for us. We'll help you. you know, we're in this thing together. So we were talking about this thing a few months ago about authority. And when I mentioned to Chris about the sphere of authority, he says, yeah, stay in your lane, dude. So yeah, stay in your lane. Don't be afraid to exercise your authority, but know from God what's your jurisdiction is, what your sphere of authority is. So Father, we thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your life, your death, your resurrection, your ascension. We thank you that you have sent your spirit back to us, to live within us, to help us to live lives worthy of the calling that you've placed upon us. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you that you are seated at the right hand of the Father and we are in you. Lord, that's a legal position. 
Help us, God. Help us, Lord, to come to realize the authority that we have and help us to exercise that authority in a godly way, in a humble way, depending upon you, Lord. Not going, getting out of our lane, not going beyond our jurisdiction. But Father, we want to make an impact in this community. Lord, we want to preach your kingdom. We want to demonstrate your kingdom. We tell you, Lord, that we can only do that with your help as you work through our lives. We ask you to come, Holy Spirit, continue to work within us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.